We'd like to start by thanking everyone for joining us today. The goal will be to wrap up the presentation and a short Q&A in 30 minutes. We'd love your questions for the Q&A. You should be able to ask them throughout our presentation. If yours isn't chosen, we will get back to you via email shortly. Also, don't forget about the handouts. We have slides and data sheets available for you. It's important to begin with a brief overview of our company, Software Diversified Services, or SDS. We have been selling commercial grade software to a wide range of organizations for over 37 years now. Our headquarters are in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with additional offices on the East Coast and Arizona. We have grown through our in-house software development and acquisitions to a portfolio of over 25 currently maintained products and a global user base. We are primarily devoted to providing quality software and support for the ZOS mainframe, with our core products focusing on the cybersecurity market. We have provided new development and support for SDS eBusiness Server since 2013, and this multi-platform encryption product remains central to our future at SDS. We are lucky to have such an amazing group of development, support, and sales professionals. Everyone's located in the U.S., and we're always willing to go the extra mile for our loyal customers. We look to partner with international partners with subject matter expertise to provide technologies that fit well with our portfolio and fill a need in the marketplace. For instance, we have collaborated with SSH Communications Security to offer the VFTP SSH solution, which provides secure FTP on the mainframe without requiring a host of JCL changes. Here are some events you may be interested in. We will be in Pittsburgh for SHARE this August. The Tech Expo runs from August 5th through the 7th and will be at booth number 217. It's located right by the SHARE booth. Lately, our development team here at SDS has been even busier than they normally are. You'll hear all about their great work on eBusiness Server for ZOS and distributed platforms shortly, but they're also focused on improving Vital Signs SIM agent for ZOS formerly SMART, which is an SDS product that delivers mainframe security event records to any SIM. There should be plenty of exciting news to share in time for the September webinar, focusing on the importance of incorporating these records into your enterprise SIM solution. For those of you that are familiar with our line of Vital Signs software, our development manager said that when work on this project has been completed, VSA will truly be an SDS Vital Signs product. And lastly, we have another SHARE webinar this October where we will be focusing on securing your ZOS FTP. Now let me introduce our presenters for today. Both work here at SDS. First, Jed Lampy, Operations and Marketing Lead, will provide information about the benefits of PGP encryption, our new FIPS validated SDS cryptographic module, and our upcoming release of eBusiness Server Release 911 on distributed platforms. Then, Gary Bortner, Quality Assurance and ZOS Support Technician at SDS, will compare the mainframe and distributed versions of eBusiness Server. Plus, he'll provide an update on what's happening with SDS eBusiness Server for ZOS. Jed, it's all yours. Thanks, Lisa. Here's an overview of what I'll be covering today. First, we'll take a look at the Open PGP Protocol and the processes and steps that make up this crypto system. Some may wonder why organizations are still using this protocol in the first place. There are plenty of reasons and benefits that come from using a product like SDS eBusiness Server, one that follows the open PGP standard, and we'll discuss them. Then I'll provide some information about our FIPS validated encryption engine, the SDS cryptographic module, along with information about the upcoming release of EBS 911 for AIX, Linux, and Windows. Lastly, I'll try to tie everything back to organizational benefits and why you should care. Then I'll hand it over to Gary for an overview of EBS for ZOS, and he'll go through some of the new features added in re recent releases for the mainframe. But before I get too far along, I'd like to give a shout out to our development team for all the hard work they've done over the last couple of years during the FIPS validation process. Just a fair warning here, going to cover quite a few topics, but I'm not going to get too in depth with anything. There's tons of great information online. Uh, we have some stuff on our website that would help uh, 
explain these things. You can always reach out to us if you need more information, but i uh, going to try to stay above the fray, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, I put this slide in mainly because I'll probably refer to OpenPGP as PGP at some point during this presentation. Gary may as well, but nearly everyone when referring to PGP encryption is talking about the PGP process or protocol, pretty good privacy, which is the OpenPGP standard. That's defined by RFC 4880, the OpenPGP message format. And there's also a couple of proprietary products, PGP and GPG, which can even confuse people more. And that's where SDS eBusiness Server fits in. It's another proprietary software product following the OpenPGP standard. So what is cryptography? It's the science of using math to encrypt and decrypt data. It provides data security when storing and transmitting data over possibly insecure networks. Then there's cryptanalysis, and that's analyzing or trying to break cryptography that uses analytical reasoning, application of math tools, pattern finding, patience, determination, luck, etc. Cryptology embraces both cryptography and cryptanalysis. How does cryptography work? Well, a cryptographic algorithm or a cipher works in conjunction with a key to encrypt plain text into cipher text. It uses a mathematical function to do so. The same plain text will encrypt to different cipher text when using different keys to encrypt the data. The overall security of this method or any method of encrypting data relies on the algorithm's strength, key randomness, and key secrecy. You may have heard the term crypto system. Well, OpenPGP is one, and it's comprised of a cryptographic algorithm, all possible keys, and all protocols that make it work. Here's a graphic of conventional cryptography, which is also called symmetric key encryption or symmetric key cryptography, where one key is used both for encryption and decryption. The benefits of using conventional cryptography is that it's very fast and it's useful for data that's being stored only. But this isn't realistic to transmit data that's been encrypted this way, as it would be very expensive and difficult to implement as you'd need to ensure that the one key is distributed securely to those needing to decrypt the data. This harkens back a bit to the older movies and spycraft where a key would be known to both the sender and recipient. They'd stash a crossword puzzle in an obviously terrible location. It'd be intercepted and decoded. Well, thankfully, the encryption is a bit more advanced than that and can be a secure method. But for a typical organization's needs, especially when there are more secure and better alternatives out there, why bother with this method as is? With the advent of public key cryptography, encryption was opened up to the masses as it was far less expensive and a much better option to transmit data. This introduced the public and private key pair. Each user's public key can be freely distributed, but the private key needs to be just that, kept private. That's because the recipient's private key is used to decrypt the data. How do you designate who the recipient is? Well, the sender uses the recipient's public key to encrypt the data. This slide shows only the basic form of public key cryptography. But a big attraction to this concept is that it's not possible to determine a private key from a public key. It also allows organizations and people who don't necessarily know each other to exchange messages in a secure fashion. RSA is an example of a public key crypto system and one that's used for eBusiness server's key generation. This has all led us up to the OpenPGP encryption method. This method makes use of both public key and symmetric key cryptography in a smart way. It leverages both methods' benefits and reduces their shortcomings. This combination of strong public key and symmetric cryptography offers security when transmitting and storing data without being too expensive or difficult to manage plus overall speed is improved. In fact, conventional encryption is at least a thousand times faster than public key encryption. But public key encryption in turn provides more convenience and a solution to key distribution and data transmission issues. Used together, performance and key distribution are improved without any sacrifice in security. When a user encrypts plain text with an open PGP product like eBusiness Server, it first compresses the plain text. 
Then the product creates a session key, which is a one-time only secret key. And I'll get into our entropy or randomness levels and verification of good entropy a bit later. Then the session key works with a fast and secure conventional encryption algorithm to encrypt the plain text. The result is ciphertext. Once the data is encrypted, the session key is then encrypted to the recipient's public key. The public key encrypted session key is then transmitted along with the ciphertext to the recipient. The OpenPGP decryption process works basically the same in reverse. The recipient's OpenPGP product then uses his or her private key to recover the session key, which the product then uses to decrypt the conventionally encrypted ciphertext. Another major benefit of public key cryptography are digital signatures and what they provide users with. This allows the recipient to not only verify who sent the information to them, but leads to the ability to verify the information of the data and verify that it hasn't been accessed or modified since it was signed by the sender. Beyond providing authentication and data integrity, a digital signature also provides non-repudiation, which means that it prevents the sender from claiming that he or she did not actually send the information. These features are fundamental to cryptography and are each major reasons why OpenPGP is still thriving. This graphic shows the basic way that digital signatures are created. You actually encrypt information using the sender's private key. Then it's allowed to be decrypted with the sender's public key. It's quite a big difference than encrypting with the recipient's public key, but this is because it can prove who sent it. There are, however, flaws with this process, and mainly, it's just very slow. It produces quite a lot of data, in fact, at least double the size of the original information, which is an ideal. But like everything so far, there's a better way. Well, when a one-way hash function is used, it actually turns any amount of information to a small, set, fixed length output according to the hash used. If the information changed at all, the hash function ensures a completely different output value is produced. For the secure digital signatures process, OpenPGP uses a strong hash function on the plaintext, creating a message digest. Then, OpenPGP uses the sender's private key and the digest to create the signature. The plaintext and signature are then sent together. When received, the recipient's OpenPGP product then recomputes the digest, verifying the signature. Whether you also encrypt the data or not is up to you, as you can do both. With the strong hash function used, the digital signature is protected and can't be taken or used in a malicious way. In public key crypto systems, the main threat of losing data is encrypting with the wrong person's key. This can happen with man-in-the-middle attacks where someone poses as the person you want to send to and provides you their key. Once you encrypt the data with their key and send it to them, it's over. The data is lost. The best way to avoid this fate is to make use of digital certificates. They are comprised of a public key, one or more digital signatures, and the certificate information, which is the information proving the user's identity, something like a passport or a driver's license. Digital Open PGP certificates, or PGP keys, are a big component in eBusiness Server and other Open PGP products. An Open PGP certificate, or key, includes but is not limited to the following information. The OpenPGP version number, the certificate holder's public key, the certificate holder's information, the digital cert signature of the certificate owner, the certificate's validity period, and the preferred symmetric encryption algorithm for the key. It can include more than that, but that's just the baseline. There are plenty of PGP-related topics I'm leaving out, and I haven't covered everything I wanted to, but I've already been going on way too long about this. Hopefully there was enough here in the last 10 minutes to point to why OpenPGP standard is still the go-to method for organizations to secure data at rest and in motion. Due to our SDS cryptographic module, or encryption engine, being a general purpose module, allowing it to be completely portable, the FIPS process was even more arduous than it is for most. For clarity, I may use the terms module or encryption engine or even SDS cryptographic module interchangeably. They're all the same thing, and I just don't want to give the impression that I'm talking about multiple things. Okay, back to the process of getting FIPS validation for the encryption engine. We've passed that hurdle and received validation. 
Our development team has done quite a lot more than just that, of course, and we'll get into that shortly. The great news is that we're slated for a Q3 release of EBS 911 for AIX, Linux, and Windows, with beta testing to begin any time in the coming weeks. Okay, I'm going to pass through these next few slides pretty quickly, as they're the certification numbers we've received from NIST during this process. If you'd like to get more information on any of these certifications, you can either search for Software Diversified Services at the NIST website's Cryptographic Algorithm Validation Program, or download the slide PDF in the GoToWebinar panel to the right, and all of these links will take you to the pertinent spot on the NIST website. Not all of these algorithms are available in the version that will be released soon, though. Support for additional algorithms will likely come with future releases, but we're kind of limited to what the OpenPGP protocol will allow. Then, for FIPS 140-2 validation for our module, only certain validated algorithms are allowed to be used for different functions that we perform. There may be fewer algorithm options available, but they've all been tested and validated, which is great. For current users of eBusiness Server, it won't seem like much has changed from 90x to 911. But during this process, we've optimized and enhanced the code base of SDS eBusiness Server. We removed the cryptographic features that were built into the product throughout and moved all of that to the encryption engine. Now there's essentially a framework to house the module and the module itself. This was imperative to make use of the FIPS validated encryption module and will be very important for all feature enhancements to the product as there's a clear structure with the algorithms not being built within the product but rather housed in the encryption engine and integrated at compile time. This is an important distinction to make as some other PGP products contain a toggle to go back and forth from FIPS mode and non-FIPS mode if they have a FIPS validated module. This sounds great in theory, but doesn't seem so practical to us. Running anything that's FIPS validated is great. However, if the server and all other components and systems aren't validated or configured for validation, you won't benefit from a compliance point of view by using a singular FIPS validated component like our encryption engine. The organizations requiring FIPS compliance are typically government agencies and those dealing with the government. And for our product, there isn't that much difference actually between the upcoming 911 eBusiness server with FIPS and without FIPS validated module for AIX, Linux, and Windows. The key difference lies in the algorithms, ciphers, and hashes that will support as several that are commonly used are not available for FIPS validation, but we wanted to continue to support those additional options for the non-FIPS version. Also, FIPS requires everything to be tested many, many times and remain in the exact same state for the duration of the validation period. The module also has a self-testing mechanism built in to continue this testing. This self-testing mechanism is only built into the FIPS validated module and it won't be part of the non-FIPS version of eBusiness Server. The great part of all this is that those running the non-FIPS version will benefit from the same enhanced security and cryptographic features found in the FIPS version. And there's something to be said for knowing that everything passes the difficult standards that we went through for validation. Another important thing to mention is our entropy levels and how we're dealing with randomness for key generation. Our entropy rated out at a 0.984, which far exceeds the mandated level of 0.96 for FIPS validation. We require the use of the hardware's random number generator to mine random strings for key generation. With how everything is working, you can be assured that the keys are as secure as they can be, and a collision would be so unlikely it'd basically be the odds of getting struck by lightning twice in the same day, different storms, buying a lottery ticket, winning hundreds of millions of dollars, and doing it again the next day. Basically, you're assured you're getting a good random key from us. We also use the DRBG validation system, SP800-90 ABLE, to validate that we are generating good keys with excellent entropy. I believe getting into this would be a bit overkill, so I'll leave it at that, but it's important to say that regardless of the version of 911 you're using, the entropy will be at the same high level, generating great keys that are random. Before I pass it over to Gary, here are some benefits you'll get from using SDS eBusiness Server or another OpenPGP product. 
Firstly, you can use it to secure data while it's at rest and in motion. An often overlooked part of this product is its use for storage and backup. Plus, the data compression levels are great too. Then there's authentication, verification, and non-repudiation. All this kind of ties together and it's very important to know who's sending you what and when. And uh, this product can do that for you. Plus, it's compatibility across platforms and also its compatibility with partners. Because it's following the open PGP protocol, RFC 4880, you can be assured that it will work great with the partner's product, assuming it's also following the open PGP protocol. Plus, it's a reliable and secure encryption method. It's been around for a while, and it's here to stay. Okay, that does it for me. Thanks a lot for your time, and I'll pass it over to Gary for eBusiness Server on ZOS News. Gary? Thanks, Chad. Now I want to take a few minutes to update you on what's happening with EBS on ZOS. We'll do a quick comparison with some of the things that Jed just talked about for EBS on the distributed platforms, covering key exchange, ciphers, and hashes. The main part of this section will be to go over some of the product enhancements starting with 790. Then finally, a very quick word about supported OS levels. As with EBS on Linux and Windows, EBS on ZOS uses the same RFC 4880 based PGP framework. This allows users on various platforms using various PGP-based products all over the world to securely transmit, receive, and validate data. There's no point in going into the details of how this works because it works here in the same way as it did when Jez discussed earlier for the distributed side. EBS for ZOS supports both Diffie-Hellman and RSA Key Exchange. I bring this up because earlier Jed was talking about FIPS. We do not currently have a FIPS-only mode for ZOS. Therefore, we don't have the restrictions on ciphers, signatures, or key exchange protocols that FIPS requires. EBS 7.9 for Linux and Windows, operating in non-FIPS compliant slash restricted mode, and the latest release of EBS for ZOS support the same ciphers, triple DES, AS128 through 256, CAS5, IDEA, and the fishes. When it comes to hashes, 7.9 supports SHA-1 and 2, along with MD5 and RIPE MD160. A slight deviation from 9.1 non-FIPS mode is that 9.1 has dropped the ability to generate MD5 hashes, whereas MVS has not. I have put this slide here not to have you memorize a lot of EBS releases, but to show you that since acquiring EBS, we've been continuously enhancing and improving the product. As you can see, we've had a major release every year or two with several minor releases in between. Now I'd like to talk about improvements starting with 7.9 which is the most recent major release of EBS on the ZOS platform. But first, let me clear up a point of possible confusion on the release numbers. You may have noticed that on Linux and Windows, EBS is at 9.x while on ZOS, EBS is at 7.x. That might lead one to conclude that EBS on Linux and Windows is more advanced or more featured than EBS on ZOS. This is not the case. The numbers diverged because before we took over the product, the MVS and distributed versions were branched. They had both been at 7.x. The distributed jumped to 8.x when the branch occurred. That was fine, but now we have a problem. If we want to go up from version 7.x in EBS, the next version up, 8.x, is already used by distributed EBS at a similar feature level to 7.x in ZOS. So instead of changing the version, we just kept upping the release and leaving the version alone, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9. I am not sure what we'll do for next major release of ZOS EBS, maybe 7.able, maybe 10.x. Back to EBS 7.9 enhancements. 7.9.0, released in May of 2017, added hardware support for triple DES and AES, speeding up and reducing CPU for encryption and decryption. We also added an improved licensing scheme. I won't go into licensing changes, fascinating as they may be, as they are only in interest to someone who is changing from a pre-7.9 version to a 7.9 version. 7.9.1, released in January 2018, had a lot of new features and improvements. It added MDC support. MDC is Modification Detection or Integrity Protection. It sounds important. Of course, a signature is also Modification Detection or pro Integrity Protection. So why MDC? Well, as RFC 4880 states, there may be times when someone might want modification detection without sender verification, i.e., they may want to say, hey, it wasn't me who sent that. Remember that PGP was conceived of as a way to send private messages between individuals. 
anonymously sending messages is probably not something that is a requirement in the business world. So the real reason we added it was that some products, GPG for example, complain if we don't use MDC. This was true even if the file was signed. Now there are ways to change the behavior, but customers didn't want to do that it's because it involved their clients. So to keep everyone happy, we added the MDC option. 791 made a number of compression related enhancements. We added the ability to select the compression algorithm, ZIP or ZLIB, and we added the ability to select compression level. The ability to set compression level lets the customer make the choice in the trade-off between speed and CPU and the size of the file. Finally, in the compression area, we added a compress-only option. Unfortunately, since the data would still have PGP headers, EBS compress-only is not so useful just to zip something. Though you could use EBS to both zip and unzip if that's what you want to do. One thing compress-only does do is to provide a useful tool in determining how much CPU is used in compression versus encryption. This proved useful when we were making some compression performance enhancements, which you'll see in 792. Moving past compression stuff, 791 also added a text option on decrypt. This is useful if someone sends you a text file but did not encrypt with the text option. This option tells EBS to treat the data like text and to interpret carriage return line feed as end of record and still more stuff in 791. We allow specification of preferred hash lists and we provided more detail in key commands. 792, released in August of 2018, provided the option to amend on errors. This was requested by a customer to make it obvious when there is a failure. We try to maintain compatibility between releases and since some people would want this feature and others would want things to operate as they have been, we made an option switch. From testing in 791, we noticed that ZLive was slow. In 792, we greatly improved ZLI performance, reducing CPU and wall clock time. Moving on to 793, which was released in April of 2019, we added a key ring read only option and a single output DD option. Key ring read only, as the name implies, opens a key ring for read only. This prevents key ring corruption when multiple users are accessing the key ring at the same time. Single output DD allows multiple encrypted files to be decrypted to a single output file. This was a custom request, like the earlier admin on error request. And like the admin on error, it is something that not everyone would want, so we made an option switch. 794 is the current release. It was released May 1st, 2019, is a and is a maintenance-only release. Remember when I said I talked briefly about supported levels of ZOS? Well, this will be so brief that I won't even put up a slide. We get calls about compatibility, and the official line is that supported levels of EBS are tested and supported on supported ZOS levels. In practice, I don't think I've ever seen a ZOS compatibility issue, other than a required C, C+, APAR, and that's not really a ZOS level thing. So I just wanted to share that so far, it hasn't been a problem. Now, having said that, tomorrow something may probably come up. Okay, that concludes the update on EBS, ZOS. Back to you, Jed. Thanks, Gary, and thank you all for your time today. Uh, thank you for your questions. We will get back to you in writing. We're not going to have a live Q&A today, unfortunately, but uh, we'll get back to you via email. And if you have additional questions, please send us an email at sales at sdsusa.com. Thank you, and have a great day.